my friends, and welcome to Art Nerds. This is the place where we talk to our nerdy friends about their artwork. Uh, my name is Michael Bryan, and today I am here with a very good friend of mine, a genius of a man who is uh, surprises me at every turn. This is my friend, Mr. Miles Norsworthy. How are you doing, Miles? I'm doing great. Hopefully those are good surprises when it happens. <laughs> every not just like, time. Yeah, it's not like, oh, oh, okay. That, I didn't know that. Hardly. <laughs> no, every time we learn something new about you, the family sits around for like an hour and like, that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is easily the coolest thing I do, so this is definitely the, the thing to focus on. Okay, well, good. Sure. Well, yeah. tell us what is your art and what... What is it you do? Uh, so the art I do is HEMA, which is short for Historical European Martial Arts. And that is like a, that's an incredibly broad term because you can think of uh, other arts that might be uh, martial and might be European and might even be historical, but kind of what separates maybe some of those things, like Olympic fencing would be like the the prime example of that it, so, so olympic fencing does fall into this category so mo some people might say yes i i think most people within the general hema community would say that it it does not fall within the hema uh, okay and the the main reason for that uh is being that not that there isn't any sort of historical basis for like olympic style fencing there absolutely is but the difference is, is that is sort of a, it's a continuous tradition. So as opposed to, say, a longsword fighting or, you know, land, you know, fighting with lance or fighting on horseback and all these other things, these, these traditions at some point basically died off. All the people who did them, all that kind of uh, tradition passing down from teacher to student was gone. And we've bas just basically been trying to, like, recreate it uh, based off all these manuscripts that could okay. be, you know, completely different languages no, even if you speak German, you might not even necessarily understand this German because this German is from, you know, the 13th century and you have to try <laughs> to figure it out. And there's there's certain assumptions that they make that they, ass they assume you know. So when you're like you're reading some sort of manuscript about sword fighting, uh, like a, there's a good example uh, for English longsword sources, of which they are very, very spare, uh, sparse. So most of the sources are going to be mostly German, which is what I focus on, and some Italian, but... I, there's really, at least as far as like medieval stuff, like fighting with long swords and pole arms and stuff like that. Like there's nothing from France. I think there might be something from Spain, a tiny bit from England. But like the English sources would be like, okay, uh, you throw a falcon, and then after that, like, wait, what's a falcon? And then not, <laughs> nothing's explained. Like, wait, how am I supposed to hold the sword? Am I coming? Like, what? What? What's the other guy doing? Why are we fighting? What's the situation? And like, that's never explained. So there's just just general pools of knowledge that are missing that you're trying to fill in is basically yeah yeah you know, exactly and even yeah even the better or i shouldn't say better sources but like the the source that we mostly walk work out of is uh Joachim meyer who was a uh burger in the 16th century but he was well respected in his time and after like that and he goes into like way more detail but even then it's like you'll read through it like wait, hold on, what am I supposed to do? And there's a, and a lot of the times there's just sort of things that like, well, at the time, like everyone kind of had like a basic understanding, like everybody fenced, so to speak. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. So it was a little more yeah, so common. Like, so. Yeah, it's so like, oh, you know how to use a sword, but let me let me tell you about this. So there's that kind of that understanding that the, the authors are almost always assuming that you have that, you know, 2022, 20, we don't have that at all. <laughs> yeah. So how do you go about uh, I mean, you have your sources, mm -hmm. and there's so many threads. Suddenly, I wanna I wanna ask you about, but um, so how do you go about filling in those filling in those uh gaps, those pools of knowledge that aren't there anymore, that have no records mm -hmm. of them? Do you just practice what you find and then figure it out, or is there some other way? Yeah, part of it, like, you definitely have to put it into action. Like, you can't, like, even a, in Meyer's book, it's like, no, I wrote this book, and people wonder why I wrote it, because you can't learn fencing just from reading a book, which is exactly what we're trying to do <laughs> to, a, to a large extent. But yeah, it's kind of like, okay, well, you, you know, you read some sort of, uh, at least in German, they call it a Stuck, which uh, translates generally to, like a, like, a play or a device or a sequence of actions that's 
trying to kind of like teach you some sort of technique or understanding of the art a drill of some sort yeah yeah so okay. like uh like eastern european or eastern european eastern martial arts like a, a kata would basically be like the same things like not not that you're supposed to do this thing it's like oh, okay i'm gonna beat this guy because i'm gonna do these 20 different actions in a row it you know it never works out like that <laughs> it's just they're like okay if you do this you know this this shtuk this kata okay there's certain techniques in there that if you're able to like piece that take that apart and kind of like build your own as you're fighting that's going to make you successful okay so it's kind of when when you're going through like one of the shtuks one of the techniques you're like well one understanding like exactly what you're doing is like okay well how do i hold the sword okay which which way am i stepping okay what's my opponent doing because that's not always described and a lot of it's kind of like reading through it sometimes checking other sources because they always borrow from each other so sometimes one source might describe something similarly and then kind of pressure testing it to some degree and okay. saying trying to figure out and and also understanding kind of like the context of what they might be describing because for a lot of long sword there might be like armored fighting might be unarmored fighting other but even when you're in armor and you're on the battlefield people not, might not be entirely covered in steel so maybe you can jab them in the throat with a with a sword <laughs> because it's not covered but if you're fighting someone you know if you're trying to somehow fight Maximilian II. He's covered in head to steel, the best steel. Like, you're not going to cut through that. You have to use very specific armor techniques, preferably not even a sword. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much. So, again, so, you, so you're you basically learning the techniques from, mm. learn, from the books. Yeah. And then how adept are you at physically doing these things? I mean... I ask you that knowing exactly how adept you are, because I've seen you in action. Oh, well, thank you. There, there are far more people more adept than me, and I'll, I'll say it, toss that out there, too. I, I, yeah, but I'm, me coming as a layman into this. Yeah, because that kind it's of— impressive what you can do. Yeah, it's definitely— a, at the end of the day, Hema people are all sword nerds. Like, I guarantee you, like, 90% of us are, like, playing D&D &D and stuff like that. We're, but at the same time, it's, like, it's an incredibly physically— uh, uh, not challenging is the word, but very exhausting activity because oh. part of it, because I, I say fencing, I'm talking about swords, but also like it's a very broad category. So like, yeah, you might be fencing with a long sword, but then you go in and now you're trying to wrestle with the person. And like, if it's an armored situation, now you're like daggers and now you're now it's and anyone who's like wrestled or done jujitsu or judo knows that is exhausting. <laughs> and now you're doing it, you know, and there's horses crashing around and you're on the mud and you're in full steel and you're trying to stab a dude with a dagger so there's like that entire so again there's like this entire context of what's going on for <laughs> how you might do these things okay yeah. the, so basically you're prepping for every scenario that you can think of and there are many scenarios many yeah, I, not, I, yeah. clearly <laughs> yeah just based on clothing alone and armor and such like that mm -hmm. let alone weather conditions and road conditions and yeah, and, and it might adding, be it might be a air quotes friendly fight that you're doing too, and you have to engage yourself a little bit differently when you do that. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There's uh one one of the guys uh, he's in Lansing Longsword Guild. He does a lot of this because he's a, he was a had his masters in history as well. He, he talks a lot about the kind of the context, and uh, one specific example of uh, I can't remember the guy's full name. It goes by Got for short. Okay. He's uh you probably you may have even heard of him. He's the uh, the one-handed German knight, Robert Baron, Robert Knight. Vaguely, yes, that makes sense. Yeah, but so yeah, at some point he was in a battle. He got hit by friendly fire. He lost his hand, but then he had like a steel replacement hand made for it, and he just spent <laughs> his whole entire life just like completely trouncing people left and right. But <laughs> he, he talks about one scenario, and he's I think he's I think this is at the Digest of Worms, and he's working for uh, this particular lord who was married to a polish princess and he goes to sit at the table but he accidentally like musses up the hair of this polish knight who proceeds to try to stab him now st if you try to stab someone that's attempted murder you can smoke that dude but god in this situation just says i think he takes out his small sword and he like just like beats the crap on with the sword it's like so like technically he could have killed that guy legally but at the same time, that guy was a Polish knight, and then his lord was married to a Polish princess. So even though he would have been necessarily justified in any other, other situation, oh, so he's, now so there's, there's like, political yeah, conditions yeah, behind so, it yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, oh, ah. you, you can't kill us, dude, because even though you were in the right, 
well, now this prince is going to be mad. Your boss is going to be mad. He's going to lose face. And yeah, now you might end up getting executed, even though <laughs> even though a guy was trying Man. to stab you for messing with his hair. So it's just, yeah, there's a lot of... So much. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, now, you, um, how many... Do, do, do you deal with... How many different types of weapons do you does FEMA deal with? So it's well, and then there's also the question of uh, when does when does one sword become another sword, or how do you like make the distinguish? How do you distinguish between different weapons like as long well? Short versus, long sword versus short sword. Where is that measurement? Yeah, delineated? so the the terms that a lot of the terms that we use today in HEMA, in fact, a lot of the concepts, not even just for the swords in general, are uh, tend to be anachronisms. So the what we're what we're doing when we use what we usually call long sword, uh, the Germans in that time would have been oh, it's a sword, it's a Schwert, but we also call them the training ones we use of a uh, feather Schwert, but which translates to feather sword. Okay. But at that time, they didn't call them feather swords. That came some time after. I'm not entirely clear. There, there was someone wrote a paper on it specifically, so there, there is an answer. I just know offhand when it comes. But uh, like they wouldn't call it a long sword. We call it a long sword. Uh, then there's like we also uh, Meyer does dusik, and a dusik is basically like a, kind of like a proto saber. So most people know what a saber is. Then you ask the difference of okay, well, what's the difference between like uh, a saber and the difference between a saber and a dusik, or the difference between a dusik and a messer, which kind of came before that? What's the difference between a messer and like an arming sword? What's the difference <laughs> between an arming sword and like the short, you know, uh, Roman uh, like gladius or spotter and stuff like that? And it's like the answer to that question is, uh, well, mm, they're all swords. They're, yeah, <laughs> exactly, eventually they're just all exactly. swords. Exactly. It's just like, well, it's it's a sword. Do you use it in one hand? Are you using it in two hands? Are you more stabbing with it? Are you more cutting with it? Are you doing both? And it's, yeah, so kind of like saying, it, it's kind of hard to say. So, so then does it mean that your techniques in uh, the fighting techniques are all dependent on the weapon? Do you, I mean, in terms of, do you adjust techniques depending on the weapon? Yeah, kind of there thing. there are definitely uh, certain techniques that work far better for certain weapons. Like a, a really good example might be, for instance, a small sword. So uh, modern Olympic fencing, the foil uh, is and was, well, was. No one's doing small sword duels as far as I know <laughs> in, in today. Uh, but yeah, so like a small sword... Uh, with few exceptions, it's like purely a thrusting sword. So it has like a triangular blade. There's usually no edge or not much of an edge. So uh, any sort of technique with a small sword, you can't really like chop someone's hand off or anything else like that. It's so there are some restrictions for that. Pokey, pokey. Yeah, straight. Yeah, and those I got actually got to uh, handle one uh, a couple years ago. It was like an antique uh, small sword from almost like 1800s or 1700s or something like that. And Neat. it's like it's like a teeny little thing. It's super light. But like you pick it up, it's like, oh wow, this thing you could murder the hell out of it. <laughs> it's like a laser pointer, and it's just like this thick steel blade. Like we call it a small sword. And a lot of people in Hema kind of like kind of poo poo. It's like, oh, it's like a you know huge long sword. You can chop someone's like, man, this thing is made to murder people. This thing's incredibly <laughs> dangerous. My God. <laughs> yeah, but but at the same time, can you use some small sword techniques? You no, know, if you were to look at say. Uh, uh, like a 18th or 17th, well, probably more 18th century uh, treatise that covers a small sword. Could you use that for uh, a 16th century side sword or small sword? Yeah, yeah, probably. So do you concentrate probably. more on techniques that, okay, I've got this sword. Mm -hmm. It's got, I can stab with it, mm -hmm. I can slice with it. So you basically focus your techniques on whatever object you have in your hand. So if I know I can't slice anybody mm -hmm. with, you know, like you said, the this this uh, fencing or small sword, mm -hmm. that's just basically yeah. the world's biggest ice pick kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's yeah. It's exactly what it is. It's a giant ice. But pick. so you know, knowing you have that in your hand, mm -hmm. you don't focus on anything mm -hmm. else. You just pick and choose what you need at the time with what you've got, kind of thing. Yeah, and that, that can certainly, and specifically for that example, the small sword, uh, there's one guy that is, was he late? I think he's late 17th century, early 18th century, uh, Donald McBain. At, at one point, he, he joined the army, who's a Scottish guy, and then uh, the his commander, or I think it was his lieutenant, is like, 
yeah, this guy can't hold his money. So he makes Donald McBain's like NCO basically keep his entire paycheck. And Donald McBain's like, well, fuck that. I want my money. You go, <laughs> he challenge like his, he challenges his sergeant to like a duel. He has a small sword that he borrows from a friend. His sergeant has like a uh, a broadsword, so his basket hilted broadsword. Kicks the crap out of Donald McBain and that sends his small sword flying. So he goes to like his fencing instructor. He's like, hey, how how do I beat a guy with a broadsword? I'm using a small sword. So the fencing instructor's like, okay, no, here's a few diff- different techniques. Here's a few things you have to focus on because, you know, you're, you're using this small sword. He's using this broadsword. So certain things will work. Certain things will not work. He learns a few things, goes back. He ends up getting his money. Oh, inter- <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, that, that dude is, is absolutely wild. He just, like, loved fighting and war and getting shot at and shooting back. Dude is, yeah, that, that's an interesting <laughs> character. That's... So what... So these so these are the kind of people that write this stuff down for you. Yeah, it's it's a mixed bag. So yeah, Donald. Uh, I had a friend of mine is actually. I think he was reading Donald McBain too, and like he's having a hard time understanding it. Cause like, what what are these words? But then he started like saying it out loud, and he realized he was like speaking in like in a very heavy like Scottish accent when he was doing it. Because <laughs> like you know, I mean like uh, standardized spelling is like fairly like a modern sort of thing so people just spelled things out as as they, 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 as they seen them. them he's like oh okay that's what he's saying got so, it that's so that yeah that guy was kind of a kind of a wild card but other people like uh Joachim meyer or like other people peter von danzig uh especially when you go older and you kind of think of like this medieval uh medieval european concept that you have like the uh what do you call them? You have those who pray, those who work, and those who fight. So kind of those who fight, uh, especially in the German tradition, you have the Fecht books. Those are usually the kind of the people who would be writing them. So it's like right. some sort of night. And then there's also the question of like why they might write them. So for like Joachim Meyer in the 16th century, who, who wasn't a knight, he wasn't nobility or anything else like that. He was very much writing uh, this book and other books with a very specific audience in mind. So you wanted to, I think this one's for... I don't know, the Elector of Palatine or something like that. So it's like, you know, dearest prince, you're super awesome. I know you love fencing and swords because you're a super great guy. I wrote this book and you should totally check it out and maybe hire me. So, so a lot of times so, it's, yeah. So one was a resume. And, yeah. 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 Oh, yes, very much so. One was a training manual mm-hmm. of sorts. Okay, interesting. That is that is a bit. Yeah, and sometimes we have no idea. And sometimes it's just there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the, the earliest uh, is usually called 133 or 033 and... Uh, there's like a few, uh, was it Walberg? I forget the name, of it, but it's most people call it just 133. It's like mostly just uh, sword and buckler. We don't really know why, who, we don't know who made it or why it was made, it's, but it's the oldest, it's the oldest extant uh, European fighting treatise that we have. How old? Uh, I think that one, was it, I think it was 13th century if I recall correctly. But yeah, I think that's, yeah, pretty sure that's the 1200s okay. yeah, at some point. Is, is it? 12th century, 12, 13th century is 1200s, mm-hmm. and that's pretty much the middle of the Dark Ages, right? I guess it depends. Well, I don't it think I want to call it the Dark Ages. The, yeah, the so medi- medieval, <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there's a... <laughs> yeah, it's a, I, think most, I think most people put the Middle Ages between 1,000 and 1,500, give or take, something in there. Yeah. Yeah, some... Yeah. I think some people put like 1450 at the latest. I think some people put yeah, 1500. Yeah, because you're getting a renaissance in yeah. Shakespeare in the late 1500s. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Interesting. Interesting. How? Okay. Yeah, Shakespeare makes fun of, I think, one or two different fencing masters at the time. Does he really? Plays. Well, yeah. So in uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet, for example, uh, when uh, who's in Mercutio, Mercutio and is, I think it's in the fight where he ends up getting killed too, right. he makes the comment that like I am the like I'm the very butcher of a button. There is an Italian fencing. There's a lot of Italian fencing masters at that time within. Uh, they're working in London, and one of them like had this. You no, know, it was very bold. So, like he's so good at thrusting, he can choose like any button on a man's chest, and he'd be able to put his sword through it as he wished. So he was uh-huh. he was kind of like Shakespeare is referencing that fencing master that his audience would have apparently known. That's interesting. Yeah. That's really cool. That's it, super cool. Now I got to do Romeo and Juliet again. <laughs> interesting. Um, what for you, what is your favorite style, weaponry, what have, where, where do you oh, land in the thing favorite. that is just the coolest of the cool? <laughs> what is the, oh, 
I don't know if I have. So we we work mostly kind of Meyer. So I think the context that we kind of do is like, okay, if you if you were a 16th century burger and you wanted to uh, become a better fencer, because again, everyone fences, but some people focus, you know, or or more focused on fencing, they become air quotes a fencer as opposed to anyone else. Well, who also fences. Right. And at least for uh, Meyer, and this is true for probably mo- a lot of the German tradition at that area, uh, not to say that there's only one tradition, only one Lichtenhauer, there are people outside of that, but uh, the sword, the Schwert, what we normally call the long sword, uh, was kind of understands as being like the basis of all combat. So just okay. because of that, that's what we start off with. So when we get new people in, we start them off long sword. So I just end up, we end up doing long sword the most. And at least within the the greater HEMA community, as far as like going to tournaments and stuff like that, I think long sword is usually like the predominant. And then, and then after that, there's the dusik, there's rapier, there's uh, uh, there's dagger, there's pike, there's halberd, and and then just straight wrestling for Meyer. So, what is your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I do like dusik. Dusik's fun. I do enjoy like doing saber okay. stuff. Okay, yeah. saber. Okay. So, yeah, like yeah, any kind of like one handed like hacky boys. I I find really a lot of fun. It's just something. It's just something very enjoyable about that to me. <laughs> Thank but you. Long- that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, that is the personality. But, oh, but long sword is really fun because long sword is like it's it's so because especially when you fight someone who's using a long sword and you're not using a long sword, using like a one handed weapon, whatever it might be. One thing that becomes like really apparent is just like, it just comes at you from like every single angle. Cause the ability to put like both hands on it and do like those, the, the short edge cuts and stuff like that. Right. It's like, it's a very, it's a very powerful weapon. It's a very unpredictable weapon. You don't really appreciate that until you don't have a long sword and you're trying to <laughs> deal with it. You're like, Oh Jesus Christ, they're coming at me from everywhere. It's yeah. only one sword. What? Yeah, it's just like blades just like flying everywhere. It's just like all these. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. <laughs> how did you get into this? Where did, how did you find your way into, into HEMA? So I guess like the, the earliest thing <sighs> was probably like reading, uh, like, uh, King Arthur and the Knights and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, when I'm like, you know, eight years old or whatever. I'm like, oh, this is really cool. I did do Olympic fencing starting when I was like 12 or 13. Really? So I did that for a few years. Yeah. Uh, uh, like the, the like we see on TV. The, yeah, like the, the, thin, uh, the thin blades. Are... Yeah, like the super whippy blades and stuff yeah. like that. So I did I did that. I did mostly, mostly foil, which is what most people start off with. The other two being uh, the air quote saber and uh, epee as well. Okay. And then I remember I remember when I was fifteen. So my first kind of like introduction to you no know, HEMA was reading uh, George Silver, who was uh, kind of a contemporary. Came a little bit after uh, Joachim Meyer as well. He's he's an Englishman as well, and I remember reading his uh, his little treatise and thinking. Like, what the hell do I do with this? Because, like, the way he just talks about, well, first off, he hates Italians. Italians are the worst fencers ever. Every single Italian should be ashamed of themselves. Get Italian, get those Italians out of England. They don't belong here. No, we should fight like the old Englishmen did. But, like, he's right in the, like, he read, or reads, he, like, talks about all the fencing. But, like, when you read it, again, like, when you don't have that context at times, like, I don't know anything more about fencing after reading this. So, like, that that didn't really help me. Spent 10 years in the army, came out of the army, went, came to University of Illinois, and there, I just like, well, like, I always had an interest in it, always wanted to do it. I was aware of HEMA, but there was never anyone close to me that ever did it. Just ended up Googling it, and there's like, oh, there's a HEMA club nearby. And just like, just, I went there, I'm like, yep, I'm doing this, this is my thing, I'm hooked, I'm never going to stop until I die. So you just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this is cool, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, and then I showed up like, what's a dust egg? Is that like a chunk of wood or something? It's just like, yeah, and I had no idea. It's just like, oh, I found it, and like, I'm going there, I'm beelining it to that, and I've been doing it ever since. That's that's a, that's fun. That's great. Um, how, how, do you collect weapons? I know you have some. I do. I, yeah, all all the weapons I have are very much like I, I wouldn't say I collect them so much like that. All of them have a very specific purpose. So like the the first thing I did, the first kind of sword purchase I did was like a synthetic because like I want to like okay, I want to have something of my own so I can practice at home and do that. Okay. And they're like, okay, well, I need to have steel because synthetic and steel like they they handle very differently for everything. So then I got like a technical fetter. Then it's like, well, I want to go to competitions. I have a lot of competitions don't allow this specific sword that I have. So then I got one. And the the more traditional fetish ferret that you most people think of when they do know what a fetish ferret is that looks like that one's like okay well i also need to do something with uh 
rapier. So I got the air quotes Meyer style rapier, which isn't actually a Meyer style rapier. It's just like a kind of rapier slash side sword. So I can do that. And now I ordered a Dussex, so I can do like a steel with the Dussex. So everything, everything is just like, okay, well, I want to use, I want to work on these techniques from the book. So I want a sword that like best represents that. Okay. And then, and then once I have that, I don't really have a desire to get like more, I want to have like 20 Dussex hanging on my wall or anything else like that. You just, you just want a, a, a complete toolbox. Yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, yeah, I just want, yeah, like, okay, one, everything, yeah, every sword in its place and a place for every sword sort of thing, yeah. <laughs> What's a Dussek again? A Dussek is, so, it's usually referred to as the, the, a wooden training weapon. In fact, I'm going to show you a picture. So, yeah, because when I first uh, started looking it up, I was like, the hell is a Dussek? Because, like, I'd never even heard of it before. And when I started actually, like, Googling it, and if you Google it, you'll find, like, a bunch of, like, dudes like chunks of wood whacking each other but there's a <laughs> bunch of pictures there too but but a dusik was like an actual steel sword that you'd go to you'd go to war with uh in fact there's a oh god is it finnish collection i think it's a finnish collection something scandinavian uh there's actually a fairly well uh preserved collection of very early 17th century so very very shortly after My- myers period of time by a few decades of dusiks uh, I think they call them Tessacks. So, uh, dus- the word Dussek itself uh, comes from a Czech word that means, I think, something like boar's tooth or or uh, like horn or something like that. Okay. So, it's, but it's also kind of uh, based somewhat off of the Messer, and you'll find sources will, where they'll call the Dussek the Messer, and they'll like they'll change between those two. And there's also like some sort of uh, Turkish Hungarian kind of uh, influences there in there. And then you kind of have the it becomes the word Dussek that the Germans end up using. Using or Tessak in the case of uh, more Scandin- uh, more nor- northern Scandinavian countries. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, you say hounds too. I'm looking at these pictures he's showing me, and it it looks like uh, a long fang. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A long, uh, about as long as your arm. But also, I noticed that the what their the handle of swords mm-hmm. is looks like the it looks like uh, each sword is like half of a pair of scissors. In terms it, of it kind the of, it kind of is, yeah. In terms of the handles, it's not the you know what you think of as a your original pommel and the hilt and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. It's just a wide blade with a hole in the end of it. Yeah, that that seems to be pretty common. Uh, there there are different styles of that dusik. I think there are ones where like there's kind of like there's an opening, so there's kind of like a bit coming over the top for a kion, and then there's kind of like a little bit, and then there's an opening kind of in the middle as well. And then I think uh, maybe these don't have nagels. So I'd mentioned uh, like kind of Messer and Dussek. They're they're basically the same thing. So what came before with the Messer, uh, basically you had like a slightly curved blade of one hand. Sometimes they're two handed as well. And you had what was called a uh, nagel or nagel. I think it's the proper pronunciation, which is just like a little bit of metal that like covered your knuckles. Okay. So there's like a little bit of like complex, but for the actual uh, like steel sharp. Tr- uh, not non-training Dussics. It was a far more complex hilt. So you're gonna have like shells and steel bars okay, going so you're on around have that it. Hand protection. Yeah, yeah, it's it's almost like a. They're almost like basket hilted sabers, so to speak. So it's a very very fancy looking, very very Renaissance looking saber, more or less. Cause, and they, yeah, because this picture you're showing me, these look like you could lose a finger in a heartbeat. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You can use. Oh, let's see here. It'd take me a while to find it, but there's one source, I think it's in uh, Tailhofer, where it shows like a guy's like entire hand being chopped off and then I'm getting domed with a, with the messers. So yeah, you can <laughs> you can definitely lose an arm with some of these things. They were many of them were very choppy, but there there was a lot of variability. Some were longer and right. a little more dexterous, some were like absolute cleavers too. Now I'm assuming you got you and your cohorts don't use sharp blades usually not no very very yeah <laughs> usually. <laughs> usually not like i i do have a sharp just to like uh uh practice doing the cuts just to make sure like okay I'm, i have good edge alignment when i'm actually doing the cut so like when i am you no know, sparring or doing drills like that i can kind of like keep that in mind where i'm like okay would that have been a good cut would that have done when i so you do have to one do? to practice on yeah yeah so i i do have a sharp uh steel long sword as well that i use the weather's getting nice. I'm probably going to be doing some more test cutting years in the near future, too, now that's not freezing out and covered in snow. 
I'm, I'm trying to picture you in your yard just going at the bushes. <laughs> <and> the <t> <laughs> I, I got like a little stance. I'll usually like there. A lot of people use tatami when they can when they can find it, and it's not crazy expensive. Uh, but I'm not gonna buy tatami because that's too expensive <laughs> for what I do. I use just like I'll use like milk jugs that I'll use. I'll fill them up with water, put them on a stand, and practice Go doing for cuts it. on yeah. them. Yeah. And how badly have you ever been injured? Oh, not. I think the worst I've ever had is I got a good strong hit on like the tip of my thumb and I had like a little tiny like line of like almost a blood blister underneath. I think that's, that's about the it? worst. Oh yeah, yeah. I think yeah, a couple of bruises here and there and that's pretty much it. Is that pretty much across the board with your the group itself or do Oh you, yeah, do you I sit think... around shot, uh swap horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> I think the well, the, the worst injury I've ever heard was like resulted in a lawsuit. And that was like two, three years ago. And that was uh, somewhere oh, in Oregon. Is Yeah, there's like a guy who just like showed it. It was like his first day. I think they were doing longsword. And like the instructor did something incredibly wrong. And like the point went ended up going through the guy's eyeball and partially <gasps> into his brain. Yeah, so that that's the worst I've heard. No one's died doing chemo as far as I know. But that's that's the worst injury I've heard so far. Wow. It's it's usually like, oh, I strained a, a muscle or I have some sort of, you know, in problem with the shoulder or hip. Those are the most common. Okay. And then after that, it's probably, hopefully, it shouldn't be a concussion. There's no reason to ever have a concussion in doing <laughs> hema, but some people just, I uh, just got to chud out with it. And then usually it's like some sort of breakage with the finger. Usually, often with like, I, I hear the most is like pinky doing saber. Because, like, it's not the most well-protected thing. And okay. then, usually for long sword, it's like the thumb gets broken, if anything. Right. So it's, it's just kind of hanging out there. Yeah, I, I would imagine... That, I, I, I would have imagined it'd be more. Like, yeah, little broken okay. bones and uh, <laughs> usually, beyond the hand. Usually not, yeah. I, I don't think I've heard of anyone... I think that the worst injury I've seen... This was at Midwinter Armazar last Armazar last time was there. And there's another one this uh the twelfth of this month. I might go. I haven't registered for it. But uh someone again, someone was swinging way harder that was ever appropriate and they got uh what we call waffled, where basically their their fencing mask, like kind of the you no know, sword hits the fencing mask, fencing mask hits them in their face, in the head, and then you kind of get this cut in the shape of the actual mesh of the fencing mask, like so on their face. Waffled. Yeah, yeah, and it just like bleeds a lot. Oh, so it's really nasty. It's just a shallow. Yeah. Because, yeah, just thin skin on bone. and like, Yeah, oh. it's just, yeah, a wire mesh just like smash into your face, yeah. <laughs> I, I've heard a couple other people getting it, but I, I saw that one happen. Everyone, and I guess that's, one thing that seems to be very different in the culture of uh, HEMA versus like other, like, uh, if you know, if you've heard like Battle of Nations and Bohurt and stuff like that. I have. Like, but like, and, and there are some people who, who will do both, but generally, like, when that happened, and there's other people around, that, like, one guy's like, if I had just done that to someone, I would feel like a complete piece of trash if I had done that. Like, it's generally just like, hey, if you're doing something that's hurting someone, like, you you were wrong. You need to control it. You, like, you are failing to do the art. Okay. You're so just being, an, you're being a, a dangerous idiot to everyone else. So there's, there's, a, there's a solid discipline behind it yeah, as well. I don't see that so much for, like, the Battle of Nations and <laughs> bow hurt people and stuff <laughs> like that. I'll see, like, yeah, you roundhouse kick. Like, I'm sorry, who's roundhouse kicking people in the 13th century in Eastern Europe? That's not a, you know, there's Jews, like, trying to concuss each other and stuff. It's like, like, ha like by all means, have your fun. I'm Do your thing. But it's just, like, it's it's a, it seems to be a very different culture right, uh, uh, between those. So it sounds like also you're, this your uh Hema is in into it for the historical accuracy mm -hmm. to a certain degree. Yeah, I'm is still right? yeah, I'm still not because like Bohurt, there is one document from Bohurt, it's actually a French document, because it they kind of base it off of like melees within their tournaments, uh like medieval tournaments, which they definitely did. And people did get injured and killed in them sometimes, so there is that element of it. But as far as like how they do things, it's not entirely clear to me uh, maybe i've just haven't seen the document they don't seem to talk about it or refer to it at all the, the only thing i saw there is like as far as like practicality within the melee was you know if someone falls down uh, a bunch of squires should surround the guy so make sure he doesn't get trampled and injured i've never seen that in bohurt so the only thing i've seen that they could do that would absolutely be historical they don't do so <laughs> i i don't know it's it's a bit of a mystery so to they're me. just playing to play yeah there's a lot of just like 
let's do MMA, but in steel. Okay. Well, if yeah, that's well, if that's your thing, have fun. Yeah. yeah. Not not knocking it. I'm, it sounds like fun. They they have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you I, you've mentioned many competitions that you've mm-hmm. done. Do you is that this uh, and of course just the sheer joy of the learning of it and everything mm-hmm. else. Do you ever perform with this? I mean, does do does the group do demonstrations, performances, Renaissance fair kind of stuff? Or funny. The, well, I, actually, I think I just we just we just talked recently about that as well. So uh, I, I wouldn't say we necessarily we don't really do demonstrations or anything else like that. Uh, as far as like our activity, it's it's always like no, we have a class. It's you know it's educational for the people that are there, okay. and and some people might go to tournaments. Assuming it's not a cheap hobby, and most of the, our students are like uh, college students, so they can't afford you know a thousand dollars worth of equipment to go go and do a tournament. So, right? Yeah. Uh, any? Uh, do you show off for uh, like once a year? Do you do some sort of? Because I know. Well, mm-hmm. I, I ask this because. Uh, uh, last year, Miles f- uh, did fight choreography for a play we did. Uh, sh- uh, she kills monsters, and he taught all of us newbies, which was a blast. Yeah, which uh, how to handle these long swords and these wonderful mm-hmm. pieces of uh, he calls you know their practice equipment for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they worked great for us, and we had a blast. Mm-hmm. We had a blast. Now, do you uh, do you do or do your your cohorts do the other things like that in a performance sort of realm, or is it strictly just just to just to be different and cool and know something new? <laughs> it's I would say it's mostly the second. I do know uh, some guys uh, SoCal Swords. I I believe they at least advertise that if there are people that are doing some sort of historical movie that they're available for like technical. Okay. Uh, expertise. So there are people who definitely do focus on that. Uh, as far as like doing it strictly for kind of a display, we haven't really done that. Uh, though I will say there is uh, the Mad Town something uh, event called Mad Town Factual, which is in Wisconsin, and in that we do try to kind of best simulate how they would have held a tournament uh, or factual that would have been historically accurate, and kind of. Part of that is like, yeah, you are you are fighting within the confines of that rule set, and you are trying to you know win. You're trying to place a cut on top of your opponent's head and not get cut yourself. Mm-hmm. But a, a big part of that is very much like you you are doing this publicly and you are doing kind of like displaying your skills. So you're you're not just trying to be like, oh, the best, you know, super most deadliest longsword fighter ever. You kill everyone you fight. No, no, no. It's not, it's not like that at all. Like there's a crowd, they're mm-hmm. watching you. You are kind of, you are very much putting on a show. So you yeah, you want to be, you no, know, you want to be strong and fast, but you want to look good. You want people to be like, oh that dude's good. Look at that. Did you did you see that? <laughs> so there's look, a flare yeah. In there. Oh yeah. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah. Flare is definitely a part of it. Yeah. So a little bit. A little bit of dash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit. Do you have any um uh, do you have any like heroes in or or muses or inspirations? I mean, do you, are there mm-hmm. people there that you that follow? I mean, I, you you've got all the the books and all, yeah. all these names, but are there any people that you know that are kind of guide you or inspire you or? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, there's oh man, I'm I'm almost almost low to start listing out names because there's going to be some really good people that I miss out as uh, miss out as well. So like uh, there, I just went up to me, Wisconsin like a few months ago and uh, we had a class with James Riley who does a lot of teaching. He's very influential as well. Uh, I had also mentioned uh, uh, Jess Finley is another one. She's done, she's done like a lot of wrestling. She's done like a lot of armored fighting as well. Uh, I, I don't think she made the video but maybe if you if you find jess fenley fenley and you're really super nice to her she'll show you the video but she did like a bunch of research about how uh, a lot of the ideas and uh the nomenclature that we use for the techniques are actually uh based on hunting stuff so like that which mm. kind of goes back to the fact that a lot of this art was you know was you no know, for those who fight this is the knights and the nobility and stuff like that so she she was a great source she always has really informative thing uh adam franti uh who i mentioned him earlier as well who's up in lansing michigan so he he had i think he has a couple uh publicly available videos so if you go to uh i think it's lansing longsword guild 
uh, on their YouTube page. He has some of his videos, so some of his lectures that he gives, and he gives a lot of context about kind of like what it meant to f what it meant to be to fight. He, he recently gave one about uh, the children of the sun and why uh, the fencers you know the you know, get everyone fences, but the real fencers are depicted as like children of the sun and kind of like the artistic motifs that go along with that and kind of what we can get from that as well. Uh, there's another guy uh, who's in. Uh, if you uh, again, he's on YouTube as well uh, for. I think it's Meyer Fry Factor Guild in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, he he's been working his way through like all the different stukes and stuff like that uh, from Meyer as well. So oh, he, he yeah, yeah. So if if you're like, hey, I want to get into this. There's no group around me, and you're like, you have the book. You're looking at the stuke. Like, what does that look like? I think I I pretty much agree with most of his interpretations. I don't think I've ever really like, disagreed with any. of any of his stuff not to say that he's right maybe we're just both wrong in the, in the same way <laughs> but he, he's been like a, a great resource for doing that stuff and going so you can kind of see like okay oh okay that's how he's holding it okay that's what he's okay, doing yeah so like that and then yeah there's like a bunch of other people there right. they're great too interesting good, good, good um to get away from uh hema h-e-m-a mm -hmm. is that right yeah um is there an art form or some sort of art that you have not dabbled in that you would like to? I'd be completely unrelated, but I would love to learn how to play the violin. Really? Yeah, I would love, but like, then it's like, oh, how much is the violin going to cost? I have time <laughs> for that. It's always like, yeah, the, the cost of being able to do it and get the lessons and have a violin has always been the thing that's like, Why well, a violin? Because no. again, mm -hmm. it seems so, because everything you do <laughs> seems so incongruous with everything else you do. <laughs> And I wouldn't have expected that. So yeah, it's like a violin. I was gonna say, like the other big activity I do is like two gun shooting. So yeah, it's it's all very <laughs> very orthogonal to it, I guess as well. I just I, I don't think there's any like like even if it, like if it's fiddle or if it's violin. So if like if it's a bluegrass music or if it's like something I'm listening from Dvorak. Like I just I like all of it. I don't think there's anything like a good violin player and a good violin plays that 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 I do not like. And yeah. Uh, so I also listen to uh, a lot of uh, Andrew Bird as well, who plays, who's an amazing violin player as well, does all kinds of very interesting things with the, the instrument, as well as other very unusual instruments too. So I've always wanted to do that, yeah. I love the, I love the contrast between, you know, coming off the battlefield and, <laughs> and playing the violin and picking up your violin <laughs> yeah. that, ju that just explains miles to that's that's so miles <laughs> in my head that is so miles um on the other end of that co on the other side of that mm. coin is there some kind of art form that you would never want to try Ooh, crochet <laughs> no, it just seems like it takes a long time to yarn's do. Yarn's not your thing. <laughs> yarn's yarn's probably not my thing. Katrina's gonna be mad. She does. Well, she doesn't do crochet, but she works with yarn. <laughs> I don't think there's anything I really wouldn't want to do. Uh, Mum for those mumble wrap. I don't. Know. Katrina's his wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I guess like anything I wouldn't want to do, I might not even consider to be art. I guess <laughs> at that point. Oh, but, that's yeah. fair. Uh, that's that's completely fair. <laughs> <laughs> harmonica yeah i probably wouldn't want to do harmonica i really? feel like i would hate to know how to the <laughs> i just feel like i guess this is true for the violin too like the the time span you have to get from starting to like not being incredibly annoying to everyone around you <laughs> is fairly long that's, that's definitely for true for the violin being a fretless string yeah, instrument i think bagpipe falls into that oh category. yeah yeah oh 100 percent. yeah <laughs> okay one last question where can we learn more about uh, your artwork, your art? Uh, I would definitely say so. Oh, God. I, Bjorn Ruther, that's his name. Bjorn Ruther, B J O with Umflaud, R N Ruther. And he's on uh, the uh, Myers Gill Hamburg, is probably like the most exhaustive uh, resource that you can find on YouTube. Uh, Anna Pranti has a lot of good stuff. He has uh, a lot of work, uh, specifically the Dussek that he has too. So I think he has like four or five different lessons going over the basics of like Dussek fighting. Uh, Jess Finley is good. Uh, but the the absolute best way to do it is uh, to go, I think it's like hemaclubfinder.com or something like that. And just like find people in the area, find a club that's local and just like say, okay, what are you guys doing? How do you do it? And if there isn't a club local, you might just have to start one yourself. That would be cool. Yeah. Need more people doing it, the, the more better. People, the more people, the better. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Awesome, awesome, awesome. 
My, thank you so much for yeah, it's been spending fun. your your afternoon with me. This again, like I say, every time I talk to you, there's more to you, and <laughs> it's just fascinating to no end. Well, and thank you. I can't thank you enough. And um, yeah, go out, find find a friend, and start teaching yourself how to historically fence. And yes. Sword fight. Histor- yeah, historically stab each other. There Historical stabbing, yeah. <laughs> or let, not. Or, or maybe just cutting. Don't let mom know. <laughs> yes, most importantly. <laughs>